Welcome to Whiskey Cast, Cask Strength Conversation, featuring news and interviews from the world of whiskey. I'm Mark Gillespie. This is episode number 818 for May 10th, 2020. Coming up in a few minutes. There are a couple of alternative fuel sources that we could use for running the stills, which could reduce our CO2 emissions as a distillery by 85% like that. The problem is it's 45% more expensive, so we need to be ready to invest into it from a what's the impact on the liquid in the future point of view. Isla's Brook Laddie Distillery has experimented with environmental programs before, but now the distillery has a new goal of going completely carbon neutral by 2025. Managing Director Douglas Taylor joins us later on WhiskeyCast in depth, and we'll also talk with Beam Suntory's Kevin Smith about the Kentucky Distillers Association's 2100 plan, which is bringing the industry together with the state's universities to ensure the viability of the whiskey industry 80 years from now. We'll also have the What I'm Tasting This Week department, your voice, and much more. It's all ahead on this edition of Whiskey Cast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Let's get started with the news. It's brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery. While political leaders around the world are focusing heavily on the COVID-19 pandemic, trade negotiators from the United States and Great Britain opened talks on a new free trade agreement this week. That agreement will eventually replace the deals between the U.S. and the European Union that are still in effect during the Brexit transition as Britain leaves the EU. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson pledged during his recent campaign to remove the 25% tariff on American whiskies as soon as possible, and the Scotch Whiskey Association is holding him to that pledge, along with calling on U.S. officials to remove a similar tariff on single malt whiskies from Scotland and Northern Ireland. The SWA also wants European Union leaders to remove the tariffs on American whiskies as well, arguing that all of the tariffs make the economic damage from the pandemic even worse for the drinks industry. In India, lockdown restrictions are starting to be lifted, along with restrictions on alcohol sales. However, some Indian states are imposing so-called corona fee taxes, as high as 70% on alcohol sales. The Financial Times reported police in Delhi had to use batons to break up fighting outside liquor stores as people pushed and shoved to get inside. Ireland may start to relax some of its lockdown restrictions as early as next week, but the country's chief medical officer says there is no realistic prospect of pubs opening up until the end of June under the best of conditions. Dr. Tony Hollihan told Ireland's RTE Radio that the Irish government's current roadmap for reopening the country doesn't call for pubs to reopen until mid-August right now, even though pub owners have been pushing to reopen next month under social distancing guidelines. Meanwhile, Ireland's whiskey industry is already crossing one of the year's biggest events off the calendar, The Irish Whiskey Awards are being cancelled for this year. The annual awards ceremony was scheduled for this October, but whiskey clubs from around the country do the judging in blind tasting sessions. Julie Christie of the Celtic Whiskey Shop in Dublin coordinates the awards each year. Although it's only a one night in October, um, it does take, you know, a good few months of organization, particularly with the, the different blind tastings that we do all over Ireland. So we just kind of felt that, unfortunately, we wouldn't really be able to implement social distancing safely and um, who kind of knows how the restrictions are going to go. So we just felt like that was the best decision to make. 
The Celtic Whiskey Shop also promotes Whiskey Live Dublin each November, and Julie Christie says that event is still on for now. With the move this year to Dublin's major convention center, there will be more room to spread out, and ticket sales may be limited to allow for social distancing. That decision is being reviewed, though, on a month-by-month basis. New whiskeys announced this week. Tamdu usually releases a new distillery-exclusive bottling during the Spirit of Speyside Festival each year, but with the festival canceled for 2020, the distillery is making this year's release available online. The Dalby Alley Dram 3 is a cask strength release matured in Oloroso sherry casks. 1,000 bottles will be available through the Tamdu website for £90 each. Cavalan is creating a new series of what it's billing as entry-level whiskies. The Distillery Select series incorporates the Distillery Select No. 1 that was released last year, and a new Distillery Select No. 2 has just been released in Taiwan, with plans to start exports in the coming months. It's priced in Taiwan at 1,000 Taiwanese dollars, that's about $33 U.S. a bottle, and is expected to reach the U.S. sometime next year. Turning to the U.S. now, Shiner Beer is one of the legendary beer brands in Texas, and Balconis Distilling has teamed up with the Spetzel Brewery in Shiner, Texas, to create a new Texas Bach whiskey. Balconis head distiller Jared Hempstead was caught by surprise back in 2017 when Shiner came calling. Our receptionist chimes into my office and says that the uh, master brewer from Festival Shiner was on the phone and wanted to talk to me about it, wanted to talk about a collaboration. And I'm not kidding when I, I really thought it was somebody kind of pranking me. Like I thought somebody was messing with me because, you know, maybe if you're not from Texas, that's a huge operation, you know, legendary historic beer brand. So yeah, I didn't really think it was real and didn't take a few seconds into the phone call before I realized like, Oh wow, this is actually their master brewer calling it was pretty wide open. You know, what kind of stuff can we even think through? And obviously they were interested in doing some barrel aged beer release. And uh, I said, yeah, we can work on that. That'd be fun. Hempstead pitched his idea to make a whiskey using the same ingredients that Spetzel uses in Shiner Bach without the hops, but using the same yeast and grain mash bill. I know they were pumped about doing some barrel aged beers, but from day one, I was like, man, I don't know. I don't think they know that we're getting the, the really sweet end of the deal on this. I don't know what the, the specific lager strain that they use as proprietary is, but they, um, yeah, they sent us over a bunch of stainless drums uh, full of liquid lager yeast and uh, supplied us with the specifics of the mash bill plus, you know, who they get it from so we can do it exact. While they have not made a new batch since then, Hempstead still has a few barrels of the whiskey maturing in Waco and wants to work with Spetzel again. The Balcones Texas Bach Whiskey will be available for a limited time in Texas and Oklahoma. It's priced at around $40 a bottle. Buffalo Trace will be releasing its next Colonel E.H. Taylor Jr. bourbon next month. The 18-year-old marriage bourbon is a bottled in bond blending of three different mash bills from 2002. Two rye-based mash bills and a weeded one. It's a one-time only release that will have a recommended retail price of $69.99 a bottle. Iowa's Templeton Rye is releasing its annual Barrel Strength Straight Rye Edition. It's distilled at MGP in Indiana and matured in Iowa before being bottled at 56.55% ABV or 113.1 proof. It'll be available in the U.S., Europe, and select international markets for around $60 a bottle. Tomatin held its second lockdown whiskey festival online this weekend, and Robertson's of Pitlockery was planning to host the Highlands Perthshire Whiskey Festival this weekend at its shop. Of course, the lockdowns made that impossible, so the festival has been turned into the Self-Isolation Whiskey Festival, and will be held online May 30th. Ewan McElwraith of Robertson's explains. We've done online tastings before. Uh, we, a lot of people do do online tastings, but we thought why not expand it and try to do an online whiskey festival. So we'd have, we've got seven distilleries coming along, uh, well, 
doing it virtually from their, their living rooms from 10 o'clock in the morning till 6 o'clock in the evening, each getting their slot and, and uh, presenting their arrangements to the band ambassadors. Uh, and in advance, we're sending out samples starting from next week to people who've ordered them so they can taste along with the, the uh, brand ambassadors. And that's slightly different. As there's, there's lots of probably what I described as one-dimensional uh, whiskey tastings when you're listening but not really able to take part unless you happen to have a bottle of what they're trying. So we thought, well, we'll send out sample packs with the miniatures for each tasting and uh, people can, can buy into these and, and literally sit and, and taste along with the, uh, the brand ambassadors. Part of the proceeds from the festival will be donated to the NHS Emergency Fund, and the sample packs can be shipped to most countries. There is a link for details at the WhiskeyCast website, and that's also where you can keep up on the latest whiskey news all week long. The news is brought to you by Heaven Hill Distillery, Heaven Hills Parker Beam made a lot of great whiskeys during his lifetime, and the whiskey that carries his name is carrying on the tradition. The 13th edition of Parker's Heritage Collection just won Best Rye Whiskey Honors and a double gold medal at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition. It also continues Heaven Hills' commitment to the fight against ALS. Find out more at heavenhilldistillery.com. Think wisely drink wisely. Don't forget to join us for our Whiskey Wednesday webcast this week. Jack Daniels master distiller Jeff Arnett will be one of our guests, along with a pair of farmers turned distillers, Mike Swanson of Minnesota's Far North Spirits and Colby Fry of Fry Ranch in Nevada. That's Wednesday at 5 p.m. New York time, 2100 GMT. And on Friday, drinks writers Joel Harrison Greer and Neil Ridley will be part of the panel for our Happy Hour webcast. Time now for the calendar of events brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling. We're getting more word on event postponements and reschedulings. The Whiskey and All That Festival in Air Scotland had been scheduled for June 6th. It has been postponed until later this year with no confirmed date announced yet. And the Whiskey Obsession Festival in Tampa, Florida, has been pushed back once again. It had been planned for June 25th, but will now be on July 9th. Meanwhile, Bonhams will go ahead with its next whiskey auction this coming Saturday in Hong Kong, and has one scheduled for Edinburgh, Scotland, June 10th. McTeers still has a live auction scheduled for May 22nd in Glasgow, as of now, Malt Stock and the Whiskey Shop Dufton will hold their relaxed whiskey quiz online this coming Sunday. And a decision on whether Malt Stock will go ahead as scheduled this September in the Netherlands is still a few weeks away. Whiskey Live Sydney is still on the calendar for June 26th and 27th in Australia, along with Whiskey Live in Brisbane on July 10th and 11th. And as of now, Whiskey Fringe is still scheduled for August 7th through the 9th in Edinburgh. Not to sound like a broken record here, but remember that all of these events are still very much subject to change at the last moment, so make sure you check with event organizers before you make any travel plans. We'll keep updating the calendar at WhiskeyCast.com as we get news on changes. The calendar of events is brought to you by Catoctin Creek Distilling, makers of Virginia's most awarded spirits. You'll find their Roundstone Rye at fine whiskey shops in 26 U.S. states and three continents, and online, too. Visit the Where to Buy page at CatoctinCreekDistilling.com to find a retailer near you. And please drink responsibly. The search never ends. But it's nice when you can come in for a landing, pause and explore the silky smoothness of single pot still Irish whiskey, matured in the finest bourbon and Oloroso sherry casks. Land on Redbreast, then be sure to pass it on. Proud sponsor of Whiskey Cast. Whiskey Cast in Depth is brought to you by Mortlock. Over the course of this year, we've been looking at the future of whiskey as the issue of climate change forces whiskey makers and consumers to look at long-term sustainability issues. 
Everything from the fuel sources for distilleries to the types of packaging we see on store shelves. Now, that's been overshadowed the last couple of months by the COVID-19 pandemic, but in a world where everything is becoming more interconnected on a global basis, it's important to not let sustainability fade into the background. In Kentucky, distillers are teaming up with the state's universities to look at the industry's future. Kevin Smith of Beam Suntory is leading the project for the Kentucky Distillers Association, and we talked during the recent Beam Institute conference at the University of Kentucky before public health lockdowns began. We call it the 2100 plan, so the year 2100, 80 years from now, we want to have this industry in good shape over the next 80 years so that the next generations of distillers, and I said generations with an S because that's what we're talking about, uh, are in a position to continue the growth of what we're seeing in the bourbon and the whiskey and the spirits industry. How do you work the uh, potential issues with climate change and sustainability and all those things in there to make sure that we have whiskey and we still have things like we have today in 80 years. Yeah, that's what's really exciting about this is we're bringing together the state's educational and research institutes to join us, join the signature industry of Kentucky and deal with and figure out not only do we have the distillers of the future and the right people trained in this, but also do the research that's necessary, whether it's through the oak genome projects or whether it's about how to farm sustainably or water uh, and, and those pieces with these great institutes like University of Kentucky or Western Kentucky or Kentucky State. University or even the technical colleges, KCTCS. And so we're inviting and we're bringing in uh, on a regular basis these university partners with the distilleries to talk about issues. And those things will surface and we'll, we'll start to deal with them. And then we bring in our industry partners, whether it's the barrel makers, people making glass, uh, the transportation logistics people. All of this becomes one big topic about how do we resolve, fix, make better, make more efficient, you know, find the energy synergies to make it work. And then you have to work the government angle into there, too, to keep the regulatory side, or at least to open up the regulatory side so that it works. Yeah, and, you know, this is the, the power of universities. Um, they, they can help us with that. Uh, Kentucky State University and the University of Kentucky are the land-grant universities, so they do have a voice. Uh, but more importantly, the other side of this, and you mentioned sustainability, and that's sustain- sustainability of how we do this social responsibility piece. And we're really excited to use the university partnerships to try and drive a sustainable message, a statewide message within our young people, within our future consumers, when they're not of legal drinking age, not to encourage them to drink, but start the conversation on how to use the products responsibly. And so sustainability goes beyond just trees, water, the air, all those environmental conditions. It has to do with people. And what we're talking about is the future growth and generation of our people. I'd say it this way. One of the things that's so critical for us is to make sure that companies and and this industry is growing in Kentucky, not because of our deep, rich heritage of distillers and bourbon, but because of the investment we're making into the future for our industry. On that note, on the sustainability side of things, switching over to your Beam Centauri hat for a second, one of the things I know you guys have done a lot of is start to put a lot of your products in PET bottles in some cases. And the reason I'm interested is because of the carbon impact of shipping heavyweight glass bottles all over the place and literally all over the world to get whiskey out to consumers. What have you guys found about using PET bottles Obviously, they they create a lighter package, but are consumers willing to go along with that if they understand that, hey, it means we're producing less of a carbon impact? We we believe so. Um, I I think there is always an issue with does it look premium enough, but oftentimes we're finding that people, once they know your brands, are more likely to say, well, the packaging is part of it. The taste is what I'm after. Uh, To your point, we've actually, we're the first distillery, uh, distilled spirits company in the U.S. I'm aware of this. Actually, we blow mold our own 1.75 1.75 PE tea bottles at our Frankfurt operations. In other words, to even save more money on shipping and be more efficient, we bring in the, the molds for the bottles, uh, blow mold, inject those, and then we'll go right in the line. And within a few minutes, that bottle goes from being looks like a little test tube to being a full bottle full of you know fine Kentucky bourbon and that's going then into the distribution network. So you're absolutely right. The little things like that will make a difference in the long term. One of the other great things about you know, PET and things like that is the ability to recycle it. Obviously, there's a lot of issues with making sure that PET gets 
out of the environment and back into, you know, our recycle system. So, but it's also very recyclable and it's lightweight and uh, the energy required is somewhat different than what's required for glass. I think there's a market for both though. And I wouldn't discount glass as a future product. It's also recyclable. You know, if you look at glass, most of the time it's got it going in. And I think so much of the recyclable uh, reuse nature of our product uh, packaging uh, is getting the consumers to, to really be a part of that solution, whether it's tr- straws, not using, you know, plastic straws or moving towards things that can be put back into a recycle program. What do you think of using plastic bottles for premium whiskeys if it can reduce the impact on the environment? If you're following us on Twitter, we have a poll on that question all week long, and I'll share the results next time around. Now, if you've ever been on Isla during a storm, you've probably seen the lights go out at least once or twice. The island's electrical grid is not the strongest, and the distilleries rely on fuel oil shipped by tanker from the Scottish mainland to run their boilers. That brings its own share of potential problems, but the waves that pound the island can also be a source of more reliable energy. Brooke Laddie has set a goal of becoming completely carbon neutral by 2025, and might just bring the rest of the island closer to that goal along with it. Managing Director Douglas Taylor and I talked during the recent World Whiskey Forum in Seattle, once again, before the lockdowns began. It's a brave and courageous move. Um, It started off with an idea to go to green energy, so green electricity, which was beyond just switching to green electricity from the grid and actually think about how we could run the stills off green energy a couple of tidal projects working off the coast of Isla. Then it started to grow arms and legs to think about, well, actually, how much CO2 do we produce as a, as a distillery across scope one, two, and three? How do we cut that down? Um, we've planted 7,500 trees in the last two years. Interesting fact, one tree planted as a sapling takes away 23 kilograms of CO2 when it's new per year. And by the time that tree's 40 years old it takes away one tonne of CO2 per year. So we started to think, and it's interesting because you talked about CO2 emissions earlier and packaging and shipping glass across the world and things. I think as a distillery, we've got an obligation to try and do what we can. So we're looking at it from an energy point of view, we're looking at it from a packaging point of view, we're looking at it from a waste point of view, and we're looking at it from a people point of view as well. So it's quite a big move, we've said, by 2025. So it's around the corner, really. We've started by moving to green electricity this year. We'll then hopefully move on to green energy. And hopefully there are a couple of options we can, in terms of using medium fuel oil that we use today. Um, there are a couple of alternative fuel sources that we could use for running the stills, which could reduce our CO2 emissions as a distillery by 85% like that. The problem is it's 45% more expensive. So we need to be ready to invest into it from a what's the impact on the liquid in the future point of view. And I know this is not something new for you guys. I remember Mark Rainier driving the Nissan Leaf electric car around Isla for a while. Yeah, that's right. So we tried AD, um, anaerobic digestion, uh, probably in 2009, 10, 11, 12, you know, that kind of era. And, uh, And we just couldn't get it to work. It was a huge capital expenditure for us as a then independent business. I think we spent, I don't know, four, five, six hundred thousand pounds on it and we got it sort of working, but it was never really, it was always suboptimal. We were either not able to, to create enough to fuel a generator or the generator wasn't big enough and it, and it just didn't work. So we decommissioned it in 2013. So this is not the first time we've had a go at going green, but we're coming back to it with a, a, a greater sense of conviction this time. And I think there's, there's a definite path forward that we can move. How hard will it be to put the turbines in the uh, in the tidal t- engines or whatever in the lock to try to generate electricity for you? It's quite hard. So there's two different projects happening. So there's one off the coast of Port Haven, which sits about eight kilometres off, and it's an eight kilometre square site. The water depth there is between, I think, 30 and 50 metres with a really nice tidal flow, flat base. So there's one project group that are trying to establish that. What happens is you you almost win a tender for, a, for a, an area of water, and this... Um, group won the tender for it but they they need to put something in the water within the next two years there's another group that have just won the tender or about to win the tender um, for the Sound of Isla so there's another site there 
and actually one or other of these is going to work. Um, the idea is that they'll put a couple of small uh, test turbines in that will produce a small quantity of electricity in, in the beginning. But if either of them come to fruition, their full-scale setup will be more than enough actually for the island. And I think this is where we need to take a step back and look at it because it started as an idea to make the Bruclari distillery green. I think the bigger task is for us to get together as an island and say, okay, rather than try and use this as a competitive advantage for us, I think the more appropriate thing to do is to get all the distillery companies together, all the amenities together and say, okay, there is a tidal energy opportunity for the island. How do we take it forward? Which horse do we back? Who's in? Who's not in? What are the the implications for each of the facilities in terms of changing the hardware that they've got so they can they can take that electricity on board uh, and if we can do it as an island initiative then I think that's got a bigger resonance globally than just us doing it as a Briclari uh, ambition so yes we've got our own timeline at 2025 but I think if we could get the island green that would be a bigger a bigger move. We'll check back in from time to time on both Brook Laddie's progress and the 2100 plan in Kentucky. That's Whiskey Cast in Depth, brought to you by Mortlock, whiskey's best kept secret, hidden away for decades in some of the world's most famous Scotch whiskies. Comes a single malt inspired by an original for a fortunate few. Discover the entire Mortlock lineup at malts.com. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit. When we have whiskey makers on our webcasts, I try to stay neutral and not pick favorites when I'm pouring a dram. So, during our Whiskey Wednesday webcast this week with Richard Patterson and Dr. Bill Lumsden, I poured a glass of the new Hammerhead 30-year-old Czech single malt that's a U.S. exclusive bottling by Glass Revolution Imports. Hammerhead was distilled at the Prodlo Brewery and Distillery in 1989, shortly before the fall of communism, and the name comes from the hammer mill they used to mill the barley. The stocks of Hammerhead have been bottled at various ages over the last decade or so, and the 30-year-old is bottled at 51.2% ABV. The nose has notes of apricots and peaches, pencil shavings, honey, vanilla, and dried flowers. The taste is tart and fruity with apricots, peaches, and a touch of mango, along with subtle spices and hints of honey and vanilla. The finish, long and fruity with subtle spices. It's an outstanding whiskey. I'm scoring the Hammerhead 30-year-old single malt a 95. Heaven Hill added the Elijah Craig Straight Rye to its range earlier this year, and I received a sample of it recently. It's bottled at 47% ABV, and the nose is spicy and well-rounded with hints of oak, caramel, and honey. The taste has spicy notes of clove, cinnamon, and allspice, balanced by caramel, honey, and butterscotch with just a hint of oak. The finish is long with gentle spices and a nice underlying sweetness. I'm scoring the Elijah Craig Straight Rye, a 93. I'll have more tasting notes in just a minute, but first, this week's tasting notes are brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey and its new Brewers Select Rye Ale Barrel Finish. It's a collaboration between Sagamore Spirit in Maryland and Sierra Nevada in California, where they filled Sagamore Spirit barrels with their red ale beer then shipped the barrels back to Maryland to give Sagamore Spirit Rye a unique touch. Look for it now at select retailers and get the whole story at sagamorespirit.com. Spiritworks Distillery in California has released a new four-year-old four-grain bourbon made with organic corn, rye, wheat, and barley, with the corn and wheat grown in California. It's bottled at 45% ABV, and the nose is spicy and woody with notes of sandalwood, tobacco, honey, vanilla, and caramel. The taste has a good balance with black pepper, clove, and cinnamon, complemented by honey, caramel, and cocoa notes, while the spices linger nicely on the finish. I'm scoring the Spiritworks Distillery's Four Grain Straight Bourbon a 90. 
Finally, Nevada's Fry family has been in the farming business for generations and started making whiskey a few years ago. Their debut release of Fry Ranch Straight Bourbon is also a four-grain whiskey, with all of the grain coming from their farm in northern Nevada near Reno and the Sierra Nevada Mountains. It's bottled at 45% ABV, and the nose has muted spices, dark chocolate, leather, tobacco, honey, and vanilla. The taste is spicy and peppery with chili powder, black pepper, and a touch of cinnamon, along with honey, caramel, and cocoa in the background. The finish, long and spicy with touches of honey and oak underneath. I'm scoring the Fry Ranch Straight Bourbon a 92. And don't forget, Colby Fry will be one of our guests on this week's Whiskey Wednesday webcast. The What I'm Tasting This Week department is brought to you by Sagamore Spirit Rye Whiskey. I'm adding these tasting notes to our searchable list of nearly 2,900 different whiskeys from all over the world. Check it out this week at whiskeycast.com. From deep in the north, far beyond the wall, the howl of the frozen wind brings word of something new. A whiskey from the land of always winter. For those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Let's open up the inbox now for Your Voice, presented by Lot 40. Last time around, we heard from Emily Harrison and Jeff Kozak of Whistlepig Rye about the great beer rescue of 2020, where they've taken in beer from craft brewers around the country that's going bad because the closings of bars and restaurants have wiped out the market for kegs, and they've been distilling that beer and turning it into whiskey. Richard Dankovic apparently couldn't resist, and here's what he posted on our Facebook page. I thought the virus only affected Corona. Guess it's affecting all the beers as well. Hope this process doesn't introduce a spillover infection into the whiskey population. I hope they're testing the batches for a yeast infection as well. I'd hate to have to socially distance myself from my whiskey collection. Of course, he's joking. But after the podcast, he added this. Just listened to today's podcast. Very insightful, as always. Thoroughly enjoyed it. As for Whistlepig's new make from beer, I guess they can call this new hybrid product Brewski, right? Slancha. I'm pretty sure that's not going to happen. Lots of comments on the Whiskey Wednesday webcast this week with Bill Lumsden and Richard Patterson. At Rye Whiskey Lover tweeted this, Dr. Bill and the nose were amazing. Thank you so much for providing it. Can we have John Campbell asking for a friend? Well, I should note that we have asked Beam Suntory about John's availability a couple of times since the lockdowns started, and their PR folks have said that John and his colleagues in the company are not doing interviews right now. We have also had similar responses from a couple of the other major whiskey companies, There is a concern on their part about being seen as inappropriately trying to promote their whiskeys during the crisis, but let it be known that John has a standing invitation to come on the webcast whenever he wants to. Steve Rush at The Whiskey Wire tweeted this, It was another good one with two industry legends, both of whom are some of the nicest people you could meet in the biz. Richard, as ever, the dramming showman. And at the Scotch World added this, The absolute must-see edition was today. What an amazing event and treat this was. I was glued to my screen and taking notes. Thank you for making this whiskey cast an early birthday present. To see this was absolutely stunning. Hashtag Whiskey Wednesday. Glad you enjoyed it and happy birthday. Now, all of our webcasts are archived on our YouTube channel, And if you're going to watch the one with Bill and Richard, I suggest you make sure you have some time. 
because we talked for almost two full hours on that webcast. Now, we don't always get to every question that comes up during the webcasts. During Wednesday's webcast, Dana Bird in Maryland asked this question. What is the most unusual thing you have paired with a dram? For example, one of our friends swears by Ardbeg and Oreos. What are we missing out on? Well, I've paired Girl Scout cookies with various whiskeys, but nothing out of the ordinary. So, what's the most unusual thing you have paired with a whiskey? Tell us on social media this week, and I'll share some of your pairings next time around. If you have something else you'd like to share with whiskey lovers around the world, you can always get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook at WhiskeyCast. Our email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. Your voice is presented by Lot 40, Canada's 100% pot still rye whiskey. Lot 40, unapologetically Canadian. Please drink responsibly. Let's wrap things up now with Behind the Label, our look at the history, science, and all those other things that make whiskey unique. It's brought to you by Writer's Tears. Let's talk about Hawaii and agriculture for a minute. I know what you're thinking. Hawaii. What do they grow there besides pineapples and sugar cane? Well, as Eric Dill of Hawaii's Koalau Distillery told us recently, sugar cane production in Hawaii is pretty much a thing of the past now. And while you might not associate Hawaii with the Corn Belt, there is definitely a connection. Actually, they produce a ton of corn here, which we're going to be 100% Hawaiian corn in our bourbon mash here by the end of the year. But it's the seed corn for the mainland. So whenever they do hybrids and crosses, they, they, they actually do that here and then ship the seed. They package up and ship the seed back to the mainland. We first heard about Koalau a couple of months ago when they switched from making whiskey to hand sanitizer because the state's entire supply of hand sanitizer was being shipped or flown to the islands from the mainland, and there was no local source available. Right now, Koalau's Old Pali Road Whiskey is a blend of their own whiskey made with Hawaiian corn and older sourced whiskey from the U.S. mainland. No word yet on when their bourbon will hit the market. If you have something you'd like us to look at on Behind the Label, just use the contact form at whiskeycast.com to get in touch with us. Behind the Label is brought to you by Writer's Tears. Writer's Tears Copper Pot, an 18th century style of premium Irish whiskey, blended from single pot still and single malt. Like yourself, it's one of life's treasured rarities, and what's rare is wonderful. Writer's Tears Copper Pot. That's all for this edition of Whiskey Cast. You'll find links for the stories in this episode in our show notes at whiskeycast.com. That's also where you'll find links for our webcasts, our Whiskey Cast HD videos, and the Whiskey Cast Tasting Panel podcast, the latest whiskey news, my tasting notes, a calendar of events, our downloadable Zoom backgrounds, and the Whiskey Photo of the Week. And, of course, you'll always find a complete archive of all of our past episodes that goes all the way back to 2005. We love hearing from you. Get in touch with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at WhiskeyCast. The email address is comments at WhiskeyCast.com. When you land on something special, you just know. Redbreast, the quintessential single pot still Irish whiskey and a proud sponsor of WhiskeyCast. From far beyond the wall comes a whiskey for those who face the oncoming storm and never stop walking. Winter is here. White Walker by Johnny Walker. White Walker by Johnny Walker. Blended Scotch whiskey, 41.7% alcohol by volume. Imported by Diageo North America, Norwalk, Connecticut. Please drink responsibly. Whiskey Cast is a production of Cast Strength Media, copyright 2020 and comes to you from the charming, yet regrettably dry town of Haddonfield, New Jersey. I'm Mark Gillespie, reminding you that when you drink, please drink responsibly. Thanks for listening, and please stay safe.